so many decisions in life, driving, healthcare, insurance. Stay tuned and watch Real Possibilities to find some answers to your many questions. Today we're talking about driving and transportation and taking the keys away or not taking the keys away and decisions that need to be made. And there's no one better to talk about those issues with us than Lolo. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for being here. You know, CAD has been around for how many years? 50 years. 50, Actually, 51 years. 51 years in this community. And they have expanded their services tremendously out of need, out of demand. Uh, tell us a little bit about CAD and what they offer. Well, recently in Delta Township, we extended our service from the Lansing Mall all the way out to Marketplace Wonderful. where that development is happening. How so did that happen? There were regional boundaries back when I was a kid. You know, I think it takes vision mm -hmm. and partnership within the community. Um, and our CEO, Brad Funkhauser, is a great visionary, um, is very committed to making sure Excellent. transportation services are available to as many people as possible. Great. So they're going to, as far as west in terms of East Lansing and Delta Township. I'm sorry, I'm sorry west Delta Township and Meridian, um, Meridian, Meridian Township. Meridian Township, that's right. What about the east side? Um, Meridian Township, Marsh Road is the, the end point there. We, we do also offer services though to rural communities, including Williamston, Stockbridge. So we go very, very far. We cover about 560 square miles within Ingham County alone, and then have partnered with both uh, Clinton Transit and E-Tran, um, you know, to continue services out there. Excellent. And what types of services do you offer? We offer both fixed route service on those 40 and 60 foot buses mm -hmm. um, and also paratransit service, um, including Spectran. Is paratransit meaning people who have mobility issues? Uh, correct, but not just those individuals. Paratransit also serves rural communities. Um, Spectran is dedicated to folks with disabilities and that requires a certification process. So if I'm in a rural community, do I need to schedule an appointment to have had to come out and pick me up? You do, yes, that would be ideal. And but, but you would do that in the rural communities, you would do that if I called and said I need a bus ride, not a special vehicle, but just a bus ride to a doctor's appointment. That's and, correct. That's excellent. That's, that hasn't always been the case. No, that hasn't always been the case, but yeah, we're very proud of that point. Great. And so when you talk about the different modes of transportation that CAD is offering, how are you now competing with um, companies like Uber or Lyft? What are you, because that's another way that people can just call and schedule an appointment. So I'm sure you're trying to be competitive. We don't actually compete with them. We work in partnership alongside them. You know, other forms of transportation are, they fit needs. Um, we're not perfect or right for every rider, um, but we're available to everyone and for most of our riders who have need. We serve a, a large marginalized population and that service is there for them as much as it is for people who are, you know, affluent and can afford right. their own transportation. I love that, that you don't compete, but you collaborate. You work together to make certain that the needs of the residents are taken care of. That's awesome. Kudos to you and to your team for doing that. So what do I need to do if I have a loved one who is, you know, I don't think they should be on the road anymore. Um, it's a tough conversation to have. Everyone hates that um, conversation. I, mean, I would love to give my keys away and have someone pick me up, drop me off, pick me up, drop me off. I guess that's called a chauffeur. Uh, so what does someone <laughs> need? What would someone need to, what's that conversation like uh, for people? And how do you know when it's time to have that conversation? Sure, that's a really tough conversation, Paula, and you're probably, you know, very unique in, in your desire to give up your keys. Um, my mother herself has experienced, um, you know, some, well, we have experienced concerns mm -hmm. about her driving and her ability to continue to drive. She is almost 90 years old. And- um, Good for her. <laughs> vision is still very, very good. Her hearing is still very good. Um, so the doctors, allowed her to continue to drive and we allow her to do that within short distances. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it is a tough conversation. Even when I bring it up today, you know, be careful, mom, mm -hmm. I'm fine, I'm fine. And, um, 
nobody wants to give up the the freedom to move about the way they want to but you know at CATA we kind of consider it a constitutional freedom mm -hmm. um, to have that independence and the ability to just move around as you as you need to and to be able to access services and to see loved ones friends um, that's really important absolutely absolutely so your mother's 90 years old and she's still driving around. That's correct. And the doctor gave her permission and her vision and her hearing's good. What do you, what's your concern? Really getting in an accident, mm -hmm. um, not being able to control other drivers on the road, um, that sort of thing is okay. very concerning. And that's a good point because it's not about the person all the time and what they can do or what they can manage, but other drivers and that at that age, particularly if you get in an accident, then that's, I mean, that's at, if you're 80, 90 years old and you get in an accident, that could be really uh, devastating for for your health, for your, right. for your your own well-being. And here you are working at CATA and your, your mother's still still not giving up uh, her, her independence. So it's a hard decision to make. It's a hard conversation for people to have. So what do people need to do? Once you have that conversation and someone wants to go from point A to point B, doctor's appointment, hair appointments, groceries, um, what do people do? Do they have to apply? Do they just call? Do they qualify? What happens? Sure. If they use our regular fixed route system, they just hop on a bus. They they should probably get acclimated to you know the schedules, uh, where to find that information, um, and all that information is available at cata.org. And um, hopping on the bus uh, fixed route is very very seamless. Um, if they're looking for other types of services. Um, I would recommend that they check out our website for what those are. Uh, if they have a certified disability through their physician, those often um, will be scheduled on Spectran. You can use all of those services, um, but Spectran is specifically unique to individuals who are certified with a disability. And what are some of the certified disabilities? Give us a few examples. Uh, wheelchair bound, um, blind, blindness, um, not being able to hear, those are typically what we see. But some, some individuals have a difficult time just moving about, you know, without physical discomfort, and so they would qualify as well. So for people who are living alone, older adults who are home living alone, um, and they are just like your mom, you're a little concerned or afraid, um, what, what options do they have? They can't use Spectrum because they're not certified disability, but what other options are available for them? We have a vast number of paratransit services that include ready ride, connector services, limited services that are more direct from say Williamston to Lansing or Mason to Lansing. Um, really getting familiar with what those services are and who they are designed for mm -hmm. and it's a personal decision, um, both to give up your car and to take public transportation. So checking those out and understanding them so that they really do fit your need. There are some restrictions, of course, you know, and so understanding that will really make you a successful transit rider. What about cost? Cost is very affordable. We are probably the lowest cost or most, most affordable option in terms of transportation services. So it's either $1.25 um, for a one-way trip or 60 cents per one-way trip if you are eligible. So the eligibility requirement is that you're a student mm -hmm. um, with valid student ID or you are a um, senior citizen and also um, we have the discounted rate for people with disabilities. So if you're a senior, or if you're an older adult, or if you have a disability, you can receive a discount of some sort. Yes, you can qualify for, for those services. Excellent. And you say qualify for those services. Is the cost less as well? Not necessarily because Spectran is $2.50 okay. per one-way trip. Okay, but that's still, with the cost of gas, that's still extremely reasonable. Absolutely. And so what? Do, how much in advance, how far in advance do people need to call or to schedule an appointment? If I'm a student and I want to go from there to my apartment, uh, I just get on the bus. I just right. get a bus card, right? And there are a lot of bus stops throughout the, the community. Every community has bus stops. But if I'm an older adult in a rural community, then I need to call in advance to make certain that. Correct. Or at least an older adult in any community, I need to call in advance. Correct. So tell me, you know, this program airs in other communities as well. What's happening throughout, just what are you seeing throughout the state in terms of transportation? What are some of the 
uh, more creative things that are happening. I do think that microtransit is probably one of the more creative types of, of services, which are much more convenient. Um, it eliminates the boundary issue, and it is a on-demand, curb-to-curb service. So you would use a an app mm -hmm. to schedule your trip, much like Uber and Lyft, mm -hmm. um, and then hop on the bus, but be able to take that seamless trip across boundary lines. Are you finding that older adults do or don't like riding on, <clears throat> excuse me, CATA or some other, uh, you know, are they hesitant to get on a bus? I don't think that they're hesitant. In fact, I think they're, the, the thing that they art articulate the most is that they're grateful mm -hmm. to be able to continue to have um, independence mm -hmm. and the freedom to move about the community like they usually would. My mother, bless her heart, she used, she lived in Ohio. She used that service all the time. She never drove a day in her life. Uh, she never had a license and she used that service for almost everything. So it was just such a blessing to be able to have that available. And there, yet, yet there's still a hesitancy from some people to uh, give up their car, or to walk away from their keys uh, a little bit. What do you think that's about? Why is that? And now you say your own mother has that too. So it's just because they're feeling as though they're giving up their independence or? I think it really is about recognizing where you are in your lifespan mm -hmm. and um, that giving that type of freedom up is um, acknowledging mm -hmm. that you're advancing in age and nearing end of life. So, um, you know, and, and my mother, for example, she could live for another 15 years um, and making those years a quality, um, fulfilling life is really, really important. So freedom uh, to drive or to have transportation is really important to opening up their world mm -hmm. and not confining them to the four walls of their residences. You know, one of the major issues that people have, <clears throat> excuse me, I get all choked up when I think about CATA, but one of the major issues that people have is security. So talk a little about how safe CATA is. CATA is very safe. Uh, we have very professional trained drivers. They go through a six-week training program um, to get their um, to get trained, and also during that period of time, they they uh, earn their CDL and CDL um, commercial driver's a, license. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, and so. It is very safe. We have uh, security services in, at our downtown CTC, the CATA Transportation Center. Um, we work in partnership with Lansing Police Department. We recently um, invited students to you know, use our services to get to school here in the Lansing School District. And their resource officers through the district are right there on premise and you know keeping an eye on things guiding people and making sure that they get around safely we also recently um, added uh, folks that we call ambassadors mm -hmm. um, who ride the buses with the students and make sure they understand how to utilize our system and that they get to school and home uh, safely if i'm a caregiver and um, i'm taking care of a loved one or just a friend do i also get to write with that friend in, uh, at the reduced rate or how does that work you can have a personal care attendant ride with you they do need to be part of your profile in our system um, and then we do need to know that you're going to have that individual ride with you which is a way to help we talked about ambassadors for students sometimes it's good to have an ambassador for an older adult as well as sure. someone that they now know there's an idea and they're comfortable with as well right yes. absolutely yes. Yeah. and so you talked about the future in terms of transportation and the and the desire to have more curb to curb driveway to driveway what's CATA doing about that we have done a lot of research, talked with a lot of other transit systems to figure out what way to incorporate that would work the best for us. It is a, um, a lot of work. It's, it's looking at different vehicle types, mm -hmm. um, looking at other systems and how we would interact with them. Um, but that footwork has been done, and so we are at a point where we're looking at vehicle type um, and you know when and how. We've got some pilot programs in place where we can test that concept out, um, and those proof of concepts are always very important. Um, One of the sure. things we learned too is older adults don't want to get in the lifts or the Ubers of the world either. They're a little bit hesitant. Now, I won't say they don't want to, but uh, to get in there alone and go through the app and all that, so making it as easy and accessible as possible. Sure. 
I hope it's something that Kat is looking at as well. We are, absolutely. And that that newness, that first time um, anxiety, um, hopefully once they've experienced it, they understand how it works and it just kind of removes that, that uh, fear. What else would you like people to know about Kat? Um, that we're here for them and we appreciate their ridership and their support. Um, it's very important to our livelihood. And again, 51 years of being on the road. What are, what's your, uh, and again, this program airs in Grand Rapids and right in other places. What's happening in other communities in Michigan? And do you know much about their transportation services there? Uh, sure, we, we do, you know, interact with each other and have conversations. Um, we are members of the Michigan Public Transportation um, Association, and so we have frequent meetings where we, we can compare notes and kind of figure out what, what's going on. Um, I would say pretty much most of them are very creative in terms of serving their populations, and most are also looking at things like microtransit services. So are you working together as a unit or is it like who's the first one, you know, the first one to market? No, we don't really compete with them. It's more sharing ideas, um, um, borrowing ideas, um, and then we customize them to fit the needs of our riders. They're not never really cookie cutters, um, but a lot of transit systems in this region do look up to us, um, including those in the Ann Arbors and the Grand Rapids and other communities, but we also look to them for inspiration and ideas. Are there model communities in the country that you look at that are doing it right? In addition to CATA? <laughs> sure. I mean, we look at, you know, we look at the local, um, local meaning statewide services, um, but there are others that are considered, um, you know, peer mm -hmm. systems, and they tend to be in bigger cities um, that serve college, university communities as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And what about, uh, you know, we have Michigan State here, we have, like you said, rural, and I'm so pleased about the rural community that you're going into. Are students using CATA a lot as well as a, a mode of transportation? Absolutely. Uh, they make up about a third of our ridership, wow. so it's a really big population of Excellent. riders. You know, I, I know my grandson did not even want to get a driver's license when he was eligible to. He waited like a year and a half to even get his driver's license. And I hear that a lot from young people. They're not that interested in driving the way that we were. You're you're right about that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was an opportunity as, as well, I assume, for, for CATA to, uh, to market and to promote their services to young people to be able to get around. I don't know what that's about, but it's it's a trend that we're seeing all over the place. It is a trend. And I think there's a commitment to sustainability and a sustainable lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, reducing our carbon footprint is very important to this current generation of students. I'm glad you mentioned that because we have some young people in our office who are all about the climate, all about the environment. So what's CATA doing, those big exhaust systems? What's happening in terms of clean air, clean energy? What are they? What are they doing to make certain that they're not polluting the air and the quality of the air? I'm glad you asked that question. So way back in the day, we we um, made a commitment to purchasing um, hybrid vehicles that um, didn't pollute the air as much. Um, our board of directors made a commitment to be completely Both. sustainable um, by 2035. So, so looking at different um, vehicle types, mm -hmm. not just electric, but there are lots of other types of vehicles out there that we, we could be researching and trying out. Do you have some of those like you're, you're testing out now or you? We don't yet. Okay. We, do, we do have a partnership with Michigan State University um, on their autonomous vehicle, mm -hmm. um, but we are looking at different types of vehicles and the funding that would help us support to bring those in um, to test them and to see how they how they work. And 2035 sounds like it's far away, but it really isn't when you think about the entire fleet that you have and to make, making certain you transition all of those into a more um, energy efficient and air pollution uh, and all that, those other factors that you have to think about when you transition. That's, that's huge. That's correct. And you know, they say time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> so we must be having fun and 2035 will be here very soon. And because we have a program, <clears throat> excuse me, called Experience for Hire, I understand there's sometimes it's hard finding drivers and our Experience for Hire program allows older adults to get back into the workplace part-time or full-time. Is CATA having a hard time finding drivers for their beautiful buses and other it vehicles. has been a challenge. Yes, mm -hmm. it's been a global challenge and it certainly um, is 
is a challenge that's present here, not just for CATA, but most of the industries that require drivers of some sort. Um, so we have conducted job fairs mm -hmm. um, every quarter and are, are trying to find really good, hardworking drivers who are committed to public service and doing a good job for us. Great, I've seen some of your ads. They are, they are very compelling, even signing bonuses. That's right. Um, we no longer offer those signing bonuses for the driver. Yeah, <laughs> you missed the opportunity. All right. <laughs> um, but for our mechanics, we absolutely do have a $7,500 signing bonus nice. for them. Yeah. Very nice. Cata, 51 years and counting. Any last minute information you want to leave with our audience? Just climb aboard. We're happy to have you ride with us. Great. Thank you so much for being here again. Appreciate all that you're doing. Make certain that the rural community, as well as the students, as well as older adults, are able to get around and have access to where they want to go. Thanks so much, Lola. Appreciate you. Thank you, Paula. Hello, my name is Tim Palmer, physician assistant with Great Lakes Center Rheumatology. And today I would like to talk about knee pain associated with osteoarthritis. What is osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis is where the knee is affected by factors such as surgeries, trauma, uh, obesity. It can even be everyday activities such as sports when you were younger or standing on a factory for your entire life and your job. It's basically the soft tissues in the joint eroding away, causing pain. The good news is, is despite the fact that we're all susceptible to osteoarthritis pain, is we have multiple different treatment options to help. So initially we would start with weight management, such as diet, exercise, and occasional use of NSAID medications, which would be Motrin, Advil, Naproxen, and sometimes some, pre some prescription strength medications, such as Celebrex or Mobic. We would also add physical therapy, as it shows that strengthening that joint helps to alleviate pain as well. With patients that have pain after those modalities, we would typically get an x-ray first to rule out if there's anything else going on. After that, we have injections that can help alleviate pain. So cortisone injections, that's a steroid that we directly inject into the knee capsule and that provides anti-inflammatory properties. After that, we do have what's called viscous therapy injections. And this is typically a series of injections, which is one a week for about three to five weeks. And this is a thick viscous gel that is used to simulate the synovial fluid that was once in the knee. That promotes smooth articulation and again, corrects pain. So despite the fact that we are all affected by osteoarthritis pain, as you know, we have multiple different treatments to help manage that. Transportation, transportation. When we think of transportation, we automatically think of CATA. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. What's the best mode of transportation someone should think about for a loved one? Sure. So CATA has two types of transportation services. Fixed rail are those 40 and 60 foot long buses that you see on the street. Mm -hmm. And those are scheduled to serve designated bus stops and transportation hubs throughout the system. Most people don't know we also have paratransit services that um, are curb to curb demand response services. But we also have Spectran, which is for individuals who are certified by a physician with a disability. So that's actually three different types of transportation. The general transportation that you get, that just the regular bus, the big 40, what did you say, 40? 40 and 60 foot. 60 foot yep. bus, and then the curb to curb, and then Spectran. How do you know which one's best for a loved one? Really, it depends on what your need is. If you have uh, mobility, the ability to move around and uh, um, look at schedules and figure that out. Uh, the regular fixed route services are the best and they are the most affordable. If you have a disability that makes it makes mobility a little bit more challenging for you, Spectrain is also a good uh, service for those individuals. And how much in advance do you need to call to schedule? You can schedule it as much as two weeks in advance, um, but it is a one day advance notice. Well, that's great information that everybody should know. So if they have some questions, they can just go to the CATA website and look this up. And that's right. Find out what transportation mode is best for them. That's correct. Great. Thank you so much for being here, Lola. Appreciate you. Thank you, Paula. Chris, you're such a 
a wealth of expertise. We appreciate you being here. One of the things we hear frequently is about the cost of long-term care mm -hmm. and how devastating that is for families who have not planned for it. What advice would you give them? Well, planning for long-term care, it's one of those things that the earlier you start thinking about it, the more options you're going to have to plan for long-term care. And as a certified elder law attorney, I'm sitting down with families and ideally we're planning ahead, but sometimes families come to us in crisis. If we plan ahead, we can put together strategies where we can protect more assets and make sure that the individual gets the best care possible. But sometimes I have families reach out to me, uh, say mom's in a nursing home now paying ten dollars to $15,000 a month, what can we do? And there are certain things that we can do to try to protect those resources, but the earlier we start thinking about these things, the more options we're going to have on the table, the more assets we're going to be able to protect, the better outcomes and the better care. And the earlier they start, the less it's going to cost them as well. And people can have their own plan, right, for themselves. They don't have to worry about someone else having a plan for you know for them. They need to create a plan, what you want to do with your life as you age, right? Right, yeah. And really, it's the key is understanding that there's really about six ways to pay for long-term mm -hmm. care. You can private pay, so you just pay out of your own funds. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can have the kids pay. A lot of times That's they don't a pay. Good idea. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times they don't pay financially, but they pay in terms of their time, where they're taking time out of their day to visit the elder law attorney or putting their life on hold to become a caregiver. Third, we can have long term care insurance, and there's some different strategies there. Fourth, Medicare pays for short term rehab, it doesn't really pay for long term care. Uh, fifth is the VA benefit, so veterans benefit. And then the sixth way to pay for long-term care is Medicaid. And so we're helping families navigate all six of those different areas. You're going to pay now, you're going to pay later, but you're going to pay. Exactly. I thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for watching Real Possibilities today. Be sure to share the information that you learned with someone else.